All right. Welcome. Um, I hope everybody got some food, got some coffee, and they're ready to they're ready to dive in. So I am here to talk about the future of hardware. So I wrote this talk um, before the conference, which was a big, you know, that's, that's a big personal feat for me because I, at, at a startup, you often work right up into your deadline. And this slide was, my very first slide, was supposed to convince you that the hardware renaissance has begun. And I arrive here uh, on Wednesday, and I look at the badge, and I'm like, wow, this is a bare circuit board with an electric imp, and now this will be my first slide. So look at your, look at your badge. The hardware renaissance has begun. About a year ago, there was an article in the New York Times, um, and it, it talked about the hardware renaissance that is occurring now in Silicon Valley. And, and paraphrasing, startups are conceiving, designing, prototyping, and venture capital is financing all these new hardware endeavors. And uh, a year and some change later, um, hardware is not only taking off, but it's also being manufactured here as well. So there's a factory in Fremont, about an hour south, that does, it's an 80,000 square foot factory, and if you're familiar with MakerBot, which is a 3D printing company started by Brie Pettis, which was recently acquired, a lot of their stuff is made in Fremont. So not only is manufacturing and hardware taking off, it's taking off here as well. Um, so the purpose of this talk I want to address is how did this happen? How did the hardware renaissance come about? Why are we wearing these chips on around our necks? And why does it matter? Um, this is a photo from a women's hardware hackathon that I spoke at earlier in the month. And I want to talk a lot about the implications of the hardware renaissance on all of us. So my name is Julia Grace. I'm the head of engineering at a very small and fantastic, in my personal opinion, startup called Tindy. And I'll talk a little bit more about what Tindy is later on. Um, we'll get to that. So this conference, I, in, in talking to a lot of people um, during the breaks and after the talks, it seems like almost everybody here is a software person. I mean, how many of you would categorize yourself if you had to pigeonhole yourself as a software person? OK, so that's, that's pretty. Now, what are, now, how many people are like, I'm a hardware person? OK, so we got, we've got one guy and, and maybe someone in the back. <laughs> so. Um, the, and I'm, I'm a software person, too. And, and I, I tell a lot of people who, when, when we're talking about Tindy, I, I'm like, I, I understand you. Like, I am a software person in a hardware world. So I've spent my entire career building and scaling software infrastructure. And up until a couple years ago, my interaction with hardware was just like opening up my MacBook Pro and then like busting out the terminal and writing some code and compiling it, and that was that. Like, I, I wasn't doing soldering, I wasn't doing any sort of robotics, nothing along those lines. So I know what it feels like, and it's OK. You're among friends. Um, but a lot, of, you know, a lot of that started to change for me. And when Chris and Yana, who are amazing New Relic employees, who are putting on this conference and doing a fantastic job, they approached me in July about coming to speak at Future Stack. And at first, I was very trepidatious because I, I'm very careful about making grandiose visions about the future. Um, because generally, predictions about the future are almost always wrong. So, where's my hoverboard, right? Like, <laughs> we think that these amazing things will happen. And, and it's important to be a visionary, it's important to be a forward thinking person. But I'm very careful about like, large scale predictions. And that changed in July. So this is one of my um, first hardware talks. And now that I've gone to the hardware dark side, I, I don't want to go back to the software side. Um, because my talks are generally usually about scaling software. Um, I have many, many slides about code, about um, infrastructure configuration. And I was in New Zealand speaking at the Web Developers Conference of New Zealand. And if you have the opportunity to go, it's an amazing conference. And New Zealand is a totally delightful place. Um, and I was talking a lot, about, a lot about location data throughout your stack. And what I concretely mean by that is 
um, taking things like latitudes and longitudes and storing them in spatial databases, specifically things like PostGIS, which is extension for Postgres, um, how to do geoencoding, which would be like taking a string like San Francisco and getting a lat long. And I came to this large like, thesis at the end of the talk, which was, in the future, everything will have location metadata. Like, really, everything will. And I showed this slide, which was, your eggs in the future will have location. And a lot of people kind of laughed and, and were like, what a like, kind of flippant thing to say. Like, like seriously, my eggs? And I, this is an, a, a product that's made from a company called Quirky. Um, Quirky manufactures, kind of is an is a inventor-friendly company that manufactures, takes your ideas, helps you manufacture, helps you scale distribution. And you can, I believe, purchase this. It's an egg tray that goes into your refrigerator, and whenever you purchase eggs, you put them in the tray, you put it in the refrigerator, and it's connected to your Wi-Fi, and then there's a little app. And so when you're at the grocery store, you can bring up your egg tray, and you can say, do I need eggs? Are my eggs old? And so in the future, future, you know, your eggs are connected to the internet. And I was like, I think that this is, that like, this is whether or not you think that this is necessarily the best use of the technology. It's kind of like, in, it's kind of interesting. You're like, oh, my eggs. So now, and, and, and in the future, the future, you're going to have these robots that you program, and they are going to be connected to the internet too. And this gentleman, Jason Huggins, he's going to come up a little later. So we'll talk about him in a, in a second. So this plays into this whole Internet of Things movement. And I know this graph is a little bit boring, but here are the Google trends of Internet of Things. So, so it's, it's becoming this, more, this bigger phenomenon. More and more people are learning about it. Um, many years ago, I used to work for IBM Research, and I was in a video about the Internet of Things. I think, I, I think that I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> it was the, the least of the, of the um, humorous takeaways of this video experience. Um, and so this is the thought that as things are all connected to the internet, all of our devices will talk to one another. They'll be able to talk to each other. We're going to have smart homes. We're going to have a smarter world. And like, this, seems, this, is, this idea is interesting. So let's travel back in time before the internet of things became so popular and, and figure out how this happened and why it happened. So there are a lot of people in the world who believe that access to technology is a fundamental thing in order to create more diverse and, the next, and, and, and ensure that the next population of engineers is getting groomed um, from an early age. So I, I am one of these people. And, and I'd like to tell you a story from my childhood. Um, I used to play a lot of video games when I was very young. And at some parent point, my parents were like, you're, you're spending like endless hours playing video games. And they bought me a really old, like from a garage sale, Commodore 64. And so I would play some video games on the Commodore 64. And then at one point, I wanted to start programming the Commodore 64. So I was, I was very young, and I didn't, I didn't drive. This is like, you know, I'm like 11 years old. I biked to the library, and I checked out books on programming. And I taught myself basic, I told myself Fortran, and I would program this computer to do things. And it, at that moment, I knew that I wanted to become an engineer. And, and, it, and it's my whole life it's been that way. I fell in love with programming because I was exposed and had that opportunity to see why computers were really awesome. And I very much feel that I was very, very lucky to have had that experience. And if my parents had never had the insight to buy me that junky old computer that would take five minutes to turn on, I would probably not be in front of you right now speaking. And so one of the barriers to building the next generation of engineers is access, and not only access in the form of cost, but access in the form of usability and ability to, and, and, and I'm so excited, and the ability to program these devices in ways that are not unbelievably difficult and really overly complex. So this is a photograph from a teen tech camp that is run by a peer of mine, Julia Elman. She's a fantastic woman, where she exposes teens from areas where there are very low populations of engineers to technology. 
So the, another person who had this same thought about ac giving access to technology to groups of people that do not traditionally have access is a man named Massimo. And Massimo is one of the creators of Arduino. And in 2005, him and his cohort, he's, he's teaching design and architecture at a, at a university in Italy. And if you ever have the ability to see him speak, he has the best Italian accent and he makes everything sound very interesting. So <laughs> I highly encourage it. Um, and so he's teaching design and he really wants his design students to begin messing around with hardware. And he looks at what's available, and what is available is the Parallax Basic Stamp Board. So this was kind of the, um, the piece of hardware that you would use in the world that predated Arduino. Um, it was 100 bucks, and everybody in the community was like, oh, this is great because you don't have to write C, you can write Basic. And in the design community, Massimo was like, I don't want my students to to learn basic, I mean, maybe they'll do that later, but I want them to learn a language that might be a little bit easier to dive into. Um, we need a, he needed a gateway drug, so to speak, to programming that wasn't basic. And so he creates Arduino with uh, a group of other amazing people. And to program in Arduino, you can use a language called Processing, which is based very loosely on Java. Um, and it's designed, it came out of MIT, it's designed to be um, much, the barrier to entry is much faster, uh, and it's, it's a much easier language to learn. And there's a, a compiler on the board, so you, your, your code is then compiled to C and run on the microcontroller on the board. And since then, you've been able to write a plethora of other languages in Arduino. So uh, suddenly, so 2005, suddenly the barrier is lowered. And barrier meaning cost, Arduinos are typically around $35. They're open hardware, so you can buy a clone for under $20. And you can use other programming languages other than BASIC. So I write a lot of Python. I'm a big Python fan. Um, and this is an actual picture of me <laughs> writing with my Arduino hooked up. And I'm writing Python because you can install a firmware onto the Arduino to talk to it in Python. And I thought that this was one of the raddest things ever. And I'll talk a little bit more about that soon. And in 2011, Raspberry Pi comes onto the scene. So Raspberry Pi was created by a man named Eben Upton, who is a professor at the University of Cambridge. And he created it because he saw the pipeline of engineering students was dropping off really rapidly. And in his tenure in teaching, he would see a lot of folks come in very early, like a decade ago, who were really excited about technology. And he just saw this, like, he was losing people every single year. And so he wanted to build a computer, and unlike Arduino, a Raspberry Pi is a, is a fully functioning computer that runs Linux. It has no peripherals. Like, when you buy a Raspberry Pi, it literally looks like that. Like, this is one of my Raspberry Pis photographed on my kind of dining room table that needs a little work. Um, and so Eben creates this device, and he creates it for students, for young people, to get into hardware hacking. Just like Massimo created Arduino for design students, Eben's like, I want to build something to lower the barrier. And when you plug in your Raspberry Pi, it comes preloaded with a Python development environment, so you can start writing Python immediately. So um, at Julia Elman's Teen Tech Camp, every student gets a Raspberry Pi, and they go into a lab, and they plug in, and its instructor shows them how awesome computers are. And they get to take it home, and I feel like this is the future of computer science. It's people coming together in a safe environment and learning how to program and being excited. I mean, you can look at the looks on their faces. Like, it's just, it makes me so excited to be an engineer. And a lot of you are thinking, that's great. Like, we need to teach our kids about computing. It's awesome. But, like, these are fundamentally technologies for children. And I challenge you. So in this, uh, this fall's Make magazine, it goes through how you can use your Raspberry Pi as a Tor proxy. So are any of you familiar with Tor? OK, so, so Tor is a way of encrypting your internet traffic to ensure that nobody can trace it back to you. So Tor was very often used. People would use, um, would use this, this means of encryption to visit a place called the Silk Road. So the Silk Road was 
I would, I would basically loosely call it an e-commerce site <laughs> where, <laughs> where you're able to buy things like drugs, <laughs> so using Bitcoin. Um, and so this is, here we have an example of a technology designed for students, but adults can use it too, and, and not just to visit the no longer existing Silk Road, but if you're very privacy conscious, um, you can turn your Raspberry Pi into this Tor proxy. And I encourage you, this um, article is actually very fascinating, and if you're interested in this, I would highly recommend it. So, um, and now, so we're starting to see this shift, right? So it's like, we want to get more designers, like students, people into technology. These devices are created, um, and then they're being embraced by the community. They're like selling out. Um, and now we see the web developers coming in. So web developers like the people in this room, like, like myself. So a friend of mine, Alistair Allen, um, documents this phenomenon very well in Make Magazine as well, talking about boards are coming out, meaning circuit boards that can be programmed by people who are from a more traditional web programming background, meaning not necessarily people who have degrees in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, because that was a lot of the people who were doing electronics prior to 2005. So in 2013, a board comes out that is called the TESOL, and you program the TESOL in JavaScript. So the web developers really are coming. Um, and you can use a lot of the node libraries when you're writing code for your TESOL. So on the chip, they ha there's a um, Lua compiler, and so it's your, your JavaScript is translated into Lua bytecode and run on the, on the TESOL, and it can be upgraded um, wirelessly. And this is also, um, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's you know, this shift of like basic to Python to now like JavaScript. And as we saw in the keynote yesterday, you know, everybody and their father is excited about Node, and their mother too, everybody. And so now you can write Node on hardware. And then this thing started happening where people were like, whoa, if I can write JavaScript and do Node on my a microcontroller, why don't I build a robot? And so this node bots phenomenon came about. And these are robots that you can program using node, and then they like engage in battles. And I had, I wanted to show a video of, an, of the node bots fighting each other, but they're, they're kind of small, and so one kept like driving off the table. So it was, it was slightly anticlimactic, but very exciting. Um, and so I think that this is a good segue to start talking about it, so Chris Dixon, who is a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, which is a venture capital firm in the Valley, he's someone who has, like, he thinks a lot about hardware. And this is one of his comments, is that when you start to see innovation in a space that's not like anything you've ever seen, most of the time, these new inventions, people like to write off as toys. And one of the examples that Chris Dixon gives is the telephone. When it was first invented, it didn't have very long range. And so all of the big manufacturing companies at the time wrote the telephone off as a toy. And later on, of course, it, it fundamentally changed communications. So in 2012, um, a, a good friend of mine starts to see a pattern going on on Reddit. Um, he's hanging out a lot in the R Arduino um, part of Reddit, and he's noticing that a lot of people are taking their Arduino and they're doing things that nobody ever could have imagined. So they're modifying the board, they're building shields, which is an add-on that you put on the board, um, to do gaming, they're printing circuit boards, and they're all exchanging these ideas in this subreddit. And so he's like, maybe there's an actual marketplace for this. Like, these people are creating these really awesome technologies. Maybe I can like build an e-commerce site for this. So that's how Tindy started. So this was the very first ver version of Tindy. So Tindy is a, is, a is a marketplace where you can buy and sell, or it was at that time, you can buy and sell homemade tech. So you can see the Gamby there. Um, the Gamby is really rad where you can t buy this board and put it on top of your Arduino. And that, that screen in the buttons, you can like play Tetris on it. Um, it's it's, it's kind of it's cool. And then there's, there's a ton of other games you can play. 
And um, one of the problems that some of our sellers started to see is you can, people get really excited when they buy a Raspberry Pi and they try to treat it like a regular computer and they overclock it and it gets really, really hot. And so suddenly someone, one of the makers in London was making uh, heat sinks for the Raspberry Pi so you can add some more heat sinks on your board. So Emil creates this site um, and it's, it starts to grow bigger than he imagined. So he calls me up and he's like, Tindy's kind of growing like crazy and I don't know what to do and like it goes down a lot. Can you come help me like scale this company and hire out a team? And after many, many discussions, I, I joined him. And now we're on like, I, I say 100 would be a, a very conservative number <laughs> as we deploy code every single day mostly for the better. <laughs> um, and so we've become kind of this, this hardware marketplace. Um, and then some really interesting things, you know, between version 1 and version 100, some interesting things started happening. So to give you an example, um, one day we get an email from a guy in London. And he's like, you know, I, I, create, I, I created this board, this circuit board, that goes on top of your Raspberry Pi, and it turns it into a weather station. So it senses temperature, barometric pressure, um, wind, like anything you can imagine it, it senses. And it comes as a kit, so you can solder it and build it yourself. He's like, I want to sell it on Tindy. And we were like, rad, like, sign up. We didn't ask for him very many questions, like, you know, how old he was. <laughs> and so he puts this up, um, and it, like, it becomes this, this sensation. So he, it ends up he's 17, and he's building this. And it's, it sells something like, in the first two weeks, he gets like 300 orders for it, which for a 17-year-old who's just messing around with hardware after school, like, that's, it, it blows his mind. And at one point, we had to start talking to his parents because we needed to transfer thousands and thousands of dollars to him. <laughs> and let's just say you can't transfer, like, $30,000 to a minor <laughs> using PayPal. So <laughs> that's, a story, that's a story for another time. Um, but this was um, one of the cool things that was built. So now I want to talk about another interesting thing that happened, which is the robot that plays Angry Birds. So I love, I love this slide because everyone laughs. Um, so are any of you familiar with the web testing framework Selenium? OK, so, so a few folks. So, Selenium can be used to spin up a browser and click through buttons on your site. So it's a great way to test perhaps like functionality that you can't test in your back end very easily. So Selenium was created by a man named Jason Huggins. And he spun off a company called Sauce Labs, which is fantastic, to do um, implementations of Selenium and to continue to build out Selenium support. And he's just an amazing, like, brilliant scientist. But what Jason really likes to do is build robots. And about a year ago, Jason had this wild idea, like most kind of mad scientists do. And he wanted to build a robot that played Angry Birds. Um, and so, and, and he had kind of been chewing on this for several years in the back of his mind. So he, he builds this first version of this robot. And he, and, and, and he doesn't really think much of it. So he puts it for sale on Tindy, and then he like goes about his business. And people started buying it, and, and a, like buying a lot of them. And this robot is not cheap. I mean, it's, I think this one retails for over $100. And so we, we call him up one day, and we're like, Jason, dude, like, you put this up for sale, but you have your quantity at zero, so people are like trying to buy, and they're adding themselves to the wait list, and like, the orders are building up. Like, what's the deal? And, and he, he's like shocked. He's like, people want to buy my robot? Like, there's a market for this? Um, and so he starts, so eventually, Jason leaves Sauce Labs, and he now builds robots full time. And this robot, it seems a little like, cute, right? Like, it's a toy. It'll play ro like Angry Birds. I can like stick in my iPad and go eat lunch and then I'll have a higher score, right? <laughs> but 
This is a mobile testing framework. Fortune 500 companies are buying this to do mobile testing. And the next version that he's built is, is even more impressive. It's all open hardware. The board on the top, he's got an Arduino, and then he's got another shield on top of it. And so like, Jason Huggins is on to something. So Tindy today is huge now. Um, we've got 1,000 products. We've got people all over the world buying. We've got businesses and government buying. Um, it kind of morphed from this niche site into this like crazy adventure uh, that we're on every day. So remember, like Raspberry Pi sold 2 million units worldwide, and it's only been available since February. And it only really went on sale in the United States like less than a year ago. And the day that it went on sale in the US, it sold out. So um, in 2013, it's 2013. Um, in 2013, a meaning a couple months ago, um, at Maker Faire Rome, Arduino announced a big partnership with Intel. So the first Arduino boards were using Atmel chips. And that, from my understanding, was kind of like this coincidence where like the stars aligned and Atmel was like, sure, let's do this, and they like put it in the boards. And then you know, Arduino takes off to like large extents, and, and Intel starts to notice. And Intel is a very big power player in the chip production business. And so Intel's like, hold on, we want our chips on your boards. So this was this big announcement that came out um, in Rome, where Massimo was on stage with Intel, and they're like, look at these like fabulous boards, and it, like everything Arduino, they like look gorgeous. Um, so so think about this, right? Like, you used to hide your circuit boards in your computer, and now we're like flaunting them and using them to meet each other. Uh, I made this slide before the conference, I swear. So, <laughs> so not only with these circuit boards, we've got these things, electric, amp, wireless, and everything. You've got um, the Spark Core, which was a Kickstarter project that raised tens of thousands of hundreds, in insane amounts of money. You know, those Kickstarter projects that, like blow up beyond proportion. And this is also a chip that will give wireless on anything. And so soon there's wireless in all things. <laughs> Um, and I feel like you know that a product has arrived into mass consumer market when there is a buying guide. <laughs> so in the most recent version of Make Magazine, there's a circuit board buying guide, because after the success of Arduino, other boards came to the market, such as the Launchpad from Texas Instruments, um, BeagleBone, other different other players came to play in the circuit board game. This is a fantastic article. If you're new to circuit boards, if you're new to Arduino, I'd really highly encourage you to buy this version of Make Magazine and read this article also by Alistair Allen. So one of the common themes that I was running into when I would go to um, places like Hackbright where I mentor and I would talk to students who had heard about Arduino and heard about Raspberry Pi but just had no idea where to start. Like they were like, hey, everybody's talking about this. I don't know how, like, what are they doing with it? Like, how, like, the barrier seemed really high. So I created something called the text we know, which is the text messaging Arduino. And this is the actual um, configuration of the board. And what, what the text we know does is if you press a button on the board, it sends a text message. So it's a pretty simple. You complete a circuit. It uses the Twilio API. My friend from Twilio is here. <laughs> so, so I, and, and I love, so the, the, it's very, the code is very simple. And I put the code up on my GitHub. Um, and I put up some really detailed instructions for how to build the text we know. So if you go to bit.ly slash hardware hacking, you will find pictures, you will find a write-up, you will find everything you need to build the text we know yourself with your kids, with your peers, whoever wants to build it as a very first like intro project. And so when you use the text we know, you get some, you're running Python, again, my favorite language. You press the button, you hope the button doesn't get jammed, because if the button gets jammed, this happens. And, <laughs> um, and then you get all these, you know, I'm using this free Twilio account, so you get all these messages from your Arduino, like, where are you? I'm hungry. Uh, that's what it'll say next, I think. So, um, 
So I went to this women's hardware hackathon um, that happened um, a couple weeks, oh, time flies, or earlier in the month um, in San Francisco, and it was hosted at a company called Stripe, and they gave up their space for Saturday and Sunday, and like over 100 women came to learn about hardware hacking. And so this was like amazing. They were, were, they were really worried that they wouldn't get um, very good attendance at the hackathon, and it was like mind-blowing. Like the place was like packed to the, to the brim, and a lot of these women had never done hardware hacking before, but they wanted, they wanted to figure out what all this, um, all this commotion was about. So they spent two days, and they all got a kit, and they, they, they started doing some hacks. And so one of the really cool things that came out of this was from a woman named Melanie who is here at the conference, and she and her team made a robot that was controlled by a leap motion sensor. So that leap motion sensor um, takes in data from your hand movement, and so her robot will move and stop and do different things based on the gestures that are, are going on with the leap motion controller. And she documented this whole project on her uh, website. So after you do TextWeno, if you want to build a robot, then you should go to Melanie's site. And if you're interested in hardware, you should talk to Melanie. She's a great engineer. She's here. Um, I hear she's available for doing some contract stuff. She's really great. So, um, so I was like, wow, this is really amazing. Like, women are coming to this hackathon having done like next to zero um, hardware stuff before. Almost none of them have ME, EE, CS degrees, and they're building robots that you can control from the gestures using your hand. And I was like, that's, that's just like, amazing. Like, think, think about the potential that could happen. So, um, so I posted my intro to hardware hacking um, tutorial on, uh, I put it on Hacker News, you know, like every engineer who wants to spread the word about their like glorious uh, endeavors into programming, and, and, and like nothing happened. So I was like, well, that sucks, but at least the ladies at the hackathon could get a project. So then it gets posted to Reddit. The story comes full circle. I guess all roads lead to Reddit. Um, and, and, and I remember, I didn't know it got posted to Reddit. And I remember, I, I often have Google Analytics, and I'm looking um, in real time at the traffic on Tindy, what people are doing on Tindy. And I remember the day that it got posted to Reddit, I remember looking at our Google Analytics and thinking, my website is the top refer to Tindy. And I was like, like, occasionally people will click on my, like, very few people will go to my website. But I was like, something's going on. And then I, I didn't think about it. And then, you know, I, I realized later that when I log into the Google Analytics account for my personal website, I was like, oh my god, like, I found the Reddit thread, and people were talking about it, and now I'm getting, like, it's getting hundreds of views a day. I get emails from people all over the world that were like, hey, this, this tutorial is really rad. Like, I, I, I'm so excited about hardware. I just, like, couldn't do it before. And so this is just the beginning. Um, there's a lot more that is happening in hardware, and thank you.